Daniel, thank you for the introduction and for asking me to be here. It's an honor and a privilege to do anything for Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, this room was not near as full when I sat down, and now I'm looking at it, and it's, it's packed. So, it's good to see everyone. My name's Sarah Nemechek, and I'm an alcoholic. I'm a member of the Primary Purpose Group in Durham. We meet on Tuesday and Friday nights. So we would love to have you. 7.30 meeting, little in between the 7 and the 8. Um, we're a 7.30 meeting, and... Uh, and it would be great to have you. Amy, I want to thank Amy for coming with me. Um, we were talking on the way here, and I think we even talked with Daniel about this when he visited us recently. Like When I got sober, it was normal to drive an hour to an hour and a half away and go to other meetings in other cities and just get out. And, and um, now we're members of a group that's realize through inventory that they want to carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous, but really have a focus on family groups. We offer babysitting and a lot of services to families at our home group. And um, so a lot of our members can't sneak away in the evening. So this is just really a treat to, to have someone to ride a long ways away with and just do that because it reminds me of what I did when I got sober. So if you're in those years when your life hasn't gotten full yet and you're still looking around for kind of some ways to get meetings in, try to try to go outside the, the one hour radius. And uh, it did a lot for me getting sober, doing the meeting on the way to the meeting and then the meeting on the way home and um, just wonderful fellowship. So anyway, so uh, my sobriety dates December uh, 24th, 1998. And it's an absolute miracle. Uh, it's good to see Wallace. He reminds me that he's known me possibly the longest of anyone in Alcoholics Anonymous. There's maybe one person that has known me longer because she tried to take me to a meeting a year prior to me get, meeting Wallace. And it didn't stick that year prior. But I met Wallace while I was living in Sanford at the old Scoggins Adolescent um, Facility. And I uh, met him at those noon meetings there in Sanford. So it's really neat to see Wallace and uh, to be seen. And um, he's certainly seen me grow up in Alcoholics Anonymous. So that's really neat. Um, so I'm going to tell you in a general way um, what I'm like, what I was like, and what happened, and what I'm like today. And um, I'm originally from Wilson, North Carolina. I was uh, born and raised there and lived almost all my life. I don't think I would have gotten out had, it, had I not gotten sober, and, and the world got immediately bigger for me. Once I got sober, I would have died right there in Wilson if I had never gotten sober. But um, I'm the oldest of four kids. I'm not from an alcoholic family. Rumor has it that my dad may have had a problem with alcohol in his younger years, but our literature probably would have classed him as a hard drinker and not a real alcoholic. He um, had a good reason. My wife, my mom, his wife, my mom, presented a good reason to stop, and um, and he was able to stop um, for many years. He does even now. He has started back drinking, but he doesn't have a terrible case like some of the examples given in the big book where they go to pieces quickly and. My dad's not that way. He can socially drink his peers today. So, but I, I didn't grow up seeing alcohol consumed, and um, I was raised in a church. I was raised Catholic. I wasn't traumatized by that. I actually had a good experience. Um, I, um, I wanted to be a nun. Um, I went to Catholic school and everything, and the, the person who made the biggest influence, had the biggest influence on me as a child was a Catholic nun, and she was a great example for me, and and uh, so I appreciated that. Um, I went through, th through some things as a child that are unfortunate, but I've realized coming into AA that I'm not the only one that went through that stuff. For many years, I thought I was, and I lived with it in secret for many, many years. It came out when I was about 13 years old that some things had happened that shouldn't have happened, and um, and I went into therapy, but that time I'd already started drinking. I discovered alcohol um, working on a horse farm. I, this horse country, I grew up riding horses too. And uh, I, I was teaching um, riding lessons at a summer camp in Rocky Mount, North Carolina with some other girls, and we would sleep on the farm. Um, and then we would, um, we would do camp all, all week long and then just kind of hang out in the evenings. And, um, and so that's in a, in a night like that, I was introduced to alcohol. And um, I was running with these two girls that were very cool, and I was not. My nickname growing up was Nerdicek. Um, my last name's Nemechek, so I was, my nickname was Nerdicek. And um, I was... Um, I was very socially awkward and I um, very shy and I had a lot of acne on my face like I was the, had the before pictures of proactive. It was very uncomfortable to it's very uncomfortable to 
oh, life in general was very uncomfortable for me. And I looked at these girls that I was running with, and life seemed so comfortable to them. And I just didn't have the same experience it felt like that they did. But when I took a drink of alcohol, I remember that I felt comfortable at life. And I remember that not only was I, you know, as good as those other girls, I was even better. We all had our eyes set on this one guy. He made, paid attention to me that night. And so the experience, the spiritual experience that was alcohol Hall multiplied in various facets that night. And so, um, and so I had a great experience with alcohol from the very first night that I was exposed to it. I wanted more. We, we all had, there were four bottles purchased. We each got one and there was one left over and three people drinking. And I can assure you, I made a point to get that fourth bottle left over. I mean, that's how clearly it was for me that alcohol was a solution for me and, and did wonderful, marvelous things for me. So I, um, I started drinking. I was 13, again, 14 years old. And um, no, it wasn't super easy to find it because I told you I didn't grow up in an alcoholic home. So it wasn't readily consumed, but my parents did have the bottles from their very wedding 15 years ago. These same bottles. That's how much they drank. So I, I figured out, I learned that I could drink that supply um, after they had gone to bed at night or if they weren't home. Um, and I was the kind of drinker that, that kind of drank in anticipation of getting ready to go out and drink. I would mix a drink and, and um, kind of do my hair and sip on something, just a regular cup from the kitchen. I may hide a bottle in my, my closet, and I would kind of get ready. The excitement of every night anticipating getting ready to go out and drink was, was contagious and, and, and kind of took over. And, um, and, and I, I suddenly discovered, you know, the social lubricant that alcohol was for me. It allowed me to finally fit in groups of people that I wanted to fit in. It allowed me to be who I thought I wanted to be. It let me to talk, uh, allowed me to talk to people. Uh, another thing that I forgot to mention is that my whole life, um, some of my earliest memories were fear. And I, I've always had panic attacks my whole life and I've had the kind of panic, attack, panic attacks that my whole body would start shaking and it and it would just something some thought would grip will grip my head and it would I would just start shaking I would have physical manifestations of, of anxiety and fear and so um, alcohol would, would calm me down um, when I had those and so it was just a great discovery for me so I worked hard in, in drinking I was a person that learned from a very young age that if alcohol worked that well on a Saturday night it would work just as well on a Wednesday night and it would work just as well on a Wednesday morning and so I'm not a person that really ever set rules for my drinking that it shouldn't happen outside these time constraints I just felt like it was fair game anytime and so that's how I proceeded to start drinking from a young age and um and I, I experienced consequences for my drinking from, from the early beginning parts of my drinking and mostly with the people that I was drinking with my behavior um was generally unacceptable when drinking, um, and uh, and so people notice that automatically. I I don't know that I ever experienced social drinking. I think that I have one of those examples that's presented in the, the big book that women often advance until the real thing very quickly, and I was like that. By the time I was 16, I was casually called an alcoholic regularly. I mean, it was I was coined an alcoholic, and um, and so there was something visibly different about the way that I drank beside the other people that I was drinking with from the very start. So by the time I was 16, I told, I mentioned earlier that Wallace, um, a year prior to meeting Wallace, I had someone take me to a meeting. So that was my first introduction to AA. It was, um, my, my drinking had obviously become problematic enough to be hanging with people that needed to go to AA, number one. And number two, to kind of be drugged there as a support. But as we all know, like people, you're generally trying to help us too. Um, when I was 16, I was institutionalized for the first time. It was um, in a psychiatric ward in Goldsboro, North Carolina. I was deemed a danger to self and others and uh, was placed there. Um, it was my first experience of the such of the sort. And um, I really walked away with that experience feeling like I had been on vacation. I don't remember alcohol ever being addressed. I remember that I was diagnosed with several mental illnesses and, um, and given some medications and then just kind of sent home, which now as a member of AA, I recognize as CPCPI opportunity lost, you know. But I don't remember ever um, 
hearing anything about the way that I was drinking, I got out and uh, the bottles on the, the prescriptions I was given said to not mix this with alcohol, but the good alcoholic that I was, I just wanted to see what would happen. And so, um, so I get out and just nothing happened. I didn't notice anything, so I just kept drinking on top of them. And I was too, a binge, I was a binge drinker to some degree at this point of my drinking because um, I would tend to semi control my drinking um, during the week, just trying to hold it together. I was in high school, and then in, on the weeknight or the weekends, I would I would tend to go on a binge. It wasn't a very unpredictable binge. It was the kind of thing where I'd keep a bag packed in my trunk because I just really never knew where I would end up and who I would end up and if I would make it home. So I just kind of kept a bag um, ready in case. And so my my um, my drinking and my emotional state was very. Um, unstable to say the least and I tended to miss my medications because the un unmanageability of my life during the weekends and I would be filled with remorse after having drank so much that weekend that I would take extra um, anticipating having to go back to the world I was just so remorseless I was I was a mess and um, and so I got out of this this treatment center this this first um, psych ward that I went to, I celebrated like any person. I celebrated and just picked up, up where I'd left off. And the next year of my drinking, um, there was a lot of progression that happened. I experienced some things in that year. They were some of the, the lowest bottoms that when I think of people and the things we talk about in Alcoholics Anonymous, like as being low bottoms, that was, that was the year that I really experienced a lot of those things. I think the things that stand out the most is that I just, my drinking, um, I, I believed it to be the only normal life. I questioned the life that I had been raised in, the life of my parents. I looked at them as abnormal. Um, and I blended, I began to fit in with people that, um, that growing up I would have never been able to fit in with. And I, I suddenly became a part of a different lifestyle that I had never um, been raised in and around. I, I really gravitated toward the... Um, the, the street lifestyle and uh, the really rough neighborhoods and I, and I became a regular um, a regular you know member of that world and um, participant of that world and um, so it was obviously alarming um, I was having a lot of consequences like I said and I was introduced I, I have done some other substances but surprisingly few compared to everything that that's out there and I, I'm a very bad alcoholic um, and, uh, but I, I experienced some other substances too, and this year was one of those years. I, I didn't particularly like the one that I, this one night that I tried it, but I ended up walking the streets of my town. I ended up doing things that I was completely ashamed of, and I ended up not being able to make it home that night. Not even, I got completely disoriented and lost. I ended up laying down in the gutter of, of the streets of my town and sleeping in the gutter that night. I've um, went through you know, periods of my sobriety where my drinking, I told you, was unacceptable to the people I was drinking with. It was eventually grew to be unacceptable to every part of the world, my family, my community, um, the police force, my, the school system. I mean, just, no, my drinking was completely unacceptable to everyone. And so um, I often had fights with my parents, and I was often kicked out. I was often, I've had my clothes bagged up in black trash bags and thrown out of the house. I've had, um, or then there's also been nights that I just ran off, and um, and so I went through, you know, a terrible stage where, every, you know, I violated every moral and principle and value that I'd ever been taught as a person, and 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 as a woman, I realized that there were things that I could do to um, manipulate situations, and sometimes there were things that I could do just to get a warm place, to you know, a warm roof over my head for a night, and and there were some nights I wasn't willing to do that, and I've you know slept in, chosen to sleep in an auto garage doorway in the rain, and on some nights so it was just a very um it, it was a it's getting to be a very ugly situation and um and all the consequences seemed to just precipitate more drinking just to be able to live with the kind of person that I was it was a cycle that I was just trapped in and I couldn't seem to get out so at the time by the time I was 17 I was um I was institutionalized again this time was not so beautiful and graceful it was um, I was uh, taken into custody by the police force my parents had me arrested from their home um, taken in handcuffs and uh, was gradually taken to um, Charter Holly Hill in Raleigh that's what it was called at that time it's not called that anymore but I was um, put in the adolescent ward and um, and it was just kind of uncertain I was just put there for for um, a, a, a week and a half kind of like the detox um, 
part of things. And, and the family was invited to come in. And what I learned out of this experience um, later, processing it clearly and seeing it from a different perspective, is that my parents, I was 17 years old, and my parents were terribly worried about me and the, the, the direction that my life was going and the way that I was drinking. And they didn't know how else to help me. And so what they decided to do while I was in this detox was to have me committed to a long-term adolescent facility to the, the, you know, to the age of 18, till my birth, 18th birthday, while they still had legal power to do so, so that they could help me, so that they could live with themselves, knowing that they had done ab absolutely everything that they could to help me while they could. Now, I couldn't see that clearly at the time, but that's the decision they made, and I think that I could honestly say now that I'm a mother that I would probably do the same thing if my child were as bad as I was at that age. But I didn't understand that I was out angry, and so we sat down for a home care plan. I discovered that I was not going to go home, that I was going to be sent to Sanford, where I met Wallace eventually. And, um, and they, decided, they decided that, to, to, you know, for my well-being, but I was outraged, and I felt like my family had turned on me, and I made a decision that day that I was going to learn to live without them, and I basically washed my hands of them. So I go off to this long-term facility, and... Um, it was strong in Alcoholics Anonymous. The, the people I learned today, the people that I, sh I don't know how I didn't even meet them in the rooms eventually, but, but they were members of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and they, we were forced to go through big book studies every week and 12 and 12 studies every week. We were forced to go to meetings. We had to dress in uniforms. You remember those uniforms that we had to wear? We had to wear ties and everything and, and like socks up to our knees and little pleated skirts. It was something else. And... Um, so I wasn't a willing participant of this program. I was outraged to be there. I didn't feel like I needed to be there, being that I had less substance abuse um, than the other kids with me. I went to the director one day, and I told him, you know, I think that you've made a mistake. I have not used all the substances that these other kids have used, so I, think, I don't think I need to be here as much as they do. And... Um, and he proceeded to tell me that I was worse than the rest of the kids. That, and, and what he was referring to was the degree to which this, this, this illness had settled in my mind and in my thinking. I had it fully entrenched in, in, in me. And, and I've learned, he told me today, that day, and I've learned and confirmed it over and over and over again, is that the person often trying the hardest not to be an alcoholic is usually the worst one. And that was my experience, is that I was trying so hard to prove to the world, like it's like it's talked about and more about alcoholism, you know, that I was trying so hard to prove that I was not an alcoholic. I would think of any example where I may have ever turned down a drink or where I may have ever drank successfully <coughs> one night, and I would use it as my evidence of why this could not be true. And I would completely deny and, and ignore the existence of hundreds of examples of nights that I couldn't pull it together. And so, or I had some consequence related to alcohol. So anyway, so I was introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous against my will. So please have patience for those people who are introduced to AA against their will because I was one of those people at one day, one time. And I fought it and I resisted everything for the first three months of this program. And finally, I realized that if I didn't start showing them something, they'd never let me out. So I, I made a decision, and I said, well, I'm going to fake it, and I'm going to tell them what they want to hear, and I'm going to do what they want me to do, but it's just going to all be false. It's going to be, you know, a facade, and it's just basically to get what I want in the end. But the reality is, is that I let my guard down, and the truth about Alcoholics Anonymous came in clearly. I remember more than ever. I remember the first time I read the Jay Walker story in the big book, and I identified with everything. And even before that got to the line where they said, if you'll substitute alcohol for jaywalking, you'll understand this completely. I already got the picture before we got to that line. And another thing, too, that really marked me and impre like made an impression, not a positive impression, but, but I remember about Alcoholics and Honest, the book, the, the big book, was that they offer several times the opportunity for if you doubt that you're one of us, go back out and try. And that almost outraged me. Like, I was almost angry. I thought they were teasing me because I knew on an on a innermost level that I couldn't drink successfully, but I was still trying so hard to prove that I wasn't. But those times where they, they said, we don't claim to have the only answer. And we'd, I just knew they said, you're going to make it back to us. You know, I just knew that's what they were saying and laughing at me and taunting me. So... <laughs> 
So anyway, so I let my guard down month three. I ended up getting a sponsor from the outside. She came in and worked with me, worked the steps with me. Um, it was a good experience. I had um, a, a, my life got a little bit better. I made a start on the four step, but unfortunately, or fortunately, for, unfortunately, this time it was time to go home. And I was turning 18, and they were going to release me. I made a connection with AA on the community, but I did not make a successful transition. Ultimately, I met some wonderful ladies. One did eventually get to be my my sponsor. I started visiting and attending AA meetings, but I came in at the last minute and I left right away. I never went out to eat. Like I hear you guys go out to eat. We're planning on going. Um, we came hungry. And, uh, and so we, um, I, I never got involved with you guys and I never got to know you and I never became a part of you. And, and so I, I had one foot, you know, out the door and one foot in AA and eventually I just went on out. I remember that that very night I semi drank successfully. I proceeded to go back and tell my sponsor that I had drank a couple beers, had no consequence suffered that night and I think that I had I thought I had some more time left in my in my drinking. I felt entirely cheated and denied good years of drinking. When I mean it made my first four step to hear you guys who got to drink 30 years. I felt like I had been cheated those good years of drinking. And, um, and so I, I resolved and I told her, I said, listen, I'm going to go back out and I'm going to drink for 10 more years. And um, it made absolute sense to me at that time. I said, I'm going to come back. I'll be 28 years old and I'll have plenty of time to come back to AA and restart my life at that time. And from the moment I told her that, I knew two things deeply. Number one, I'd make it back to you guys. I've always made it back to you guys. And, uh, but I knew that I'd have to come back to AA. I knew that it was my home. From, from that point, I knew that I belonged here. And number two is that I knew that I was willing to lose everything, that I'd have the complete ability to restart my life. And when I say restart my life, I promise you that I lose everything when I drink. I come in and I have nothing. My only aspiration, and I don't mean to offend anybody when I tell this, but my only aspiration when drinking was to find a man that would support my habit or to get a government check coming in. Um, and I would, my aspiration every day was just to drink every day all day long. And I, that's the only way that I could live and, uh, and function at the end of my alcoholism. So I returned to drinking with this plan. I'm going to drink for 10 more years. And um, unfortunately, I had a head full of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it did not mix well with the body full of booze. That one successful night that I thought to tell my sponsor as proof why I could drink 10 more years, within a couple times drinking, I was as bad as ever. I remember that you guys had predicted things would happen. And I saw those things happen if I returned to drinking, but yet I had no ability to stop. Like I couldn't get off the wagon. I couldn't get off the spiral. Like it was, I was going down and I could see it all around me and I couldn't seem to stop. And what terrified me was how bad things were going to have to be. Because the things that were happening were bad enough. They should, to any normal person, these things would have caused people to stop. And unfortunately, they didn't have the power to get me to stop. And so, um, so it terrified me, and I, I just didn't know what it was going to take to get me back to AA. And so right before Thanksgiving of 98, I ended up um, getting, um, I got in a car accident. I was passed out. Um, and um, that night, I had learned some very, very, serious consequences of my drinking. I had the jaywalker experience with many things in my as consequences for my drinking. But the things that really, even to the point where I was coming here to Sanford to live, like one of the things that I was most afraid of every time I got put somewhere were blood tests. And, and that was the thing that just kind of like I'd be afraid and then I'd barely miss it. And then a short time later, I'd be in the same position. And this time really hit home for me because, um, I had realized, I'd learned that night that I was in that car accident that, that I had been exposed, a very real exposure to HIV. And, um, and I just kind of resolved that that was, there was, it was impossible based on the scenario and the setup and everything that had happened. It was just impossible to evade that consequence yet another time that I had missed all these times and I just didn't see that there was any way to have, have missed it again. And so and my response to that reality, that truth was that 
and what I believe at that time was the truth is that I told the guy I was with, I was still underage, I couldn't even buy alcohol myself, but I gave him everything, every single penny that I had in my possession, I gave it to him, and I just asked him to go into the ABC store and buy me everything he could with that, because that was the only solution that I could think of that would just shut that reality off, and um, so I ended up, actually, that guy that, that purchased my alcohol was driving, and he ended up wrecking my car in a railroad track like I'm the perfect I mean I when I do that when I do things I don't do things small like they're big so this car was wrecked in the railroad track with the front wheel was wedged in the track um, and the rear end sticking up it was unable to move the car the trains had to be stopped in my in my small town that I'm from to get the car out he was on the run and had a gun on him and in substances on him that he was selling he had to leave the scene because he could not be caught so I end up getting charged with all this stuff leaves me at the scene of the crime I go to jail that night um, I end up being fine I'm in jail because I'm in there with my friend's mother who happened to already be in there like that's the world that I had fallen into and um, my mom and dad just resolved they said you know what you are where we know you are alive and technically safe, and you can stay there until your court date. Because they, they just really washed their hands of me that night. They were just done. And I understand that today, looking back. But they left me there to just really sit and think about what the, the circumstances of my life. Now, I, I didn't... I remember it, when I was sitting in that jail cell, there was a girl in town for a court date. She had a 12 and 12 with her. And I remember asking her to read her 12 and 12 because I was getting, I was kind of toying with the idea of going back to AA. I did finally find someone else to bond me out after a couple days. I did bond out and I got out and I drank for the next month in that just kind of drinking that Tom, I used to talk about, about just kind of blotting out the reality of what life was, that kind of drinking, just shutting it off and not, not wanting to be present in the world, not draw a sober breath. And, um, and, and right before Christmas um, of 98, I ended up getting sober. And, um, and so uh, I um, went out that night with my mother begging me, please, um, please don't... Um, Please don't, uh, don't go out tonight. Please don't ruin another holiday for us. And I had a knack for ruining holidays. I was violent in my home. Um, I had fought my dad and given him a black eye. I, I saw those Christmas pictures recently, and he had a black eye for Christmas pictures that I had given him. Um, and uh, I wrecked cars on holidays, rolled them, you know, um, just awful stuff. I had a knack for ruining holidays. And they begged me not to go out, but I was restless, irritable, and discontent, and I was coming apart at the seams, and I needed desperately a drink just to, just to calm me down and so I left that night and I had run out of people being from being that I'm from a small town I became labeled in my town as having HIV and so no one would have anything to do with me and so that was a very degrading experience also and um and even knowing that I had suffered that consequence I was completely capable and did put other people at risk and that was a very very low on the totem pole human experience that I had where where I can erase anything that if I ever think I'm better than anyone I may not have you know shot someone or killed someone in that way but I totally was capable and did of uh, you know put other people at risk in another way and and so I I went out that night because someone finally like I my remonstrances of friends had terminated in a row and I became a lone wolf there was no one that I could find that would come get me and they this one guy came and get me and it was just a, a genuine he shared you know alcohol with me that night nothing in it exchange and uh, and, and I just remember more than ever that night, something happened that never had before is that the alcohol didn't shut off my mind. It didn't shut off the reality of what I was living and it didn't work anymore. And, um, and something very uncharacteristic of me is that I just told him to take me home midnight, you know, mid, mid, in the middle of the, the evening we had, I just told him to take him home, which was completely not my style. I tended to, to, to kind of run it through, run it, let it run its course, and then come to, sneak in the door the next day when they were at work, take a shower, rest, and then make sure I was gone by the time they came home. That was my style. But this time I went home, and I interacted with my mother and I begged for her. Um, I asked her for something out of the refrigerator. I was hungry. I, I didn't really beg. I demanded. I, I was running the streets. I thought I was a thug. I almost got a gold tooth. Um, people, <laughs> people, um, I was committed to that lifestyle. I'm telling you, I'm all in. When I'm in something, I'm all in. 
And, uh, and so I, I demanded something to um, eat out of um, the refrigerator for my mom in a desperate effort to keep me calm and quiet because she had three younger children in the home. Do you want this? Do you want this? Going through the refrigerator, just trying to keep me calm. And, and she would say, no, no. I would say, no, no, no. And, and in the midst of that interaction, I remember our eyes meeting, and I remember seeing fear in her mm-hmm. eyes, and I remember seeing sadness in her eyes. And um, that, to me, I... Today, looking back, I know that that was my moment of clarity. Something changed in that interaction within me. That willingness came where it had never before been able to muster that. Something changed. The very next day is the day that I mark as my first day of sobriety, December 24, 1998. I went to AA. I was in very bad shape. I told you I was a round-the-clock drinker. I was working at a night diner. Um, I was running the place. My drinking buddy was a 54-year-old woman. I, I... I mean, even in the midst of the insanity, and she was probably not the greatest influence on me, she watched, she protected me in that world. And I do, like, there were little angels in my world, regardless of people realize or not. She was very good to me. She was like my mother. Her name was Duke Bug. And uh, she knew where all the liquor houses were, and she knew where all the stores were the next morning. We would work that shift. We would run it. We just wanted the two of us on that shift. If you tried to come in on our shift, we would run you off. Um, but we ran that shift, and then after we got off, we would go and we would drink, um, starting at 7 o'clock in the morning. And she would ask me, you know, like just regularly, she'd be like, you know, Sarah, are you going to work tonight? And I would tell her sincerely, I would say, you know, Monica was, was her true name. I say, Monica, you know, it really just depends on who I see in between now and then. And that was how I lived. I just could not predict anything that was going to happen. And so um, I ended up... Um, uh, I ended up keeping that job coming in sober, but I told you that, that um, I was in bad physical shape. I tell you all this because I was drinking around the clock and I didn't always bathe. And I believe that because of not bathing, I got a big sore on my body that I won't give you any more details, but I was not bathing, you know, and I got, I was in bad shape when I came here from, I believe from that. And, uh, and I was in pain, this kind of pain they compared to childbirth. And, um, but I'll telling you, I can't tell you how many women I sponsored through the years that couldn't walk through the, down those, like those stairs that you came in here, like, or came up here, you know, they couldn't walk down those steps to get to our meeting. And I'm telling you, I don't care how much pain I was in, I was ready to go to AA. And so like something was different. And I went back to AA and I got that same sponsor that I'd gone to that night. You know, my 10 years that I, that I wanted to drink were three months. And, uh, and I came in on my knees, hands and knees crawling. I was 18 years old when I got here. And, um, and, and I've been able to stay by the grace of God. I plugged into an excellent group that, that many of you guys know, um, and line of sponsorship and, and, ethic of, 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 of home group and then service outside the home group in, in prisons and jails and things like that and um, and in everywhere in treatment facilities like I was looking at your 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 board I like your board Amy we should put this in at our home group and uh, and so um, but I, I got sober in a group like that and and I began to work the steps immediately with a sponsor and I hated I hated doing my four step and she had to babysit me through the four step she would meet me there before the group and sit with me while I wrote because I I don't like to look under the surface I don't like to look at what's really going on that's why I drank let's just shut that off let's just cover all that up and AA wanted me to look at all that stuff I drug my feet for that for those my feet for the, that first four step and and a lot changed on steps one two and three um i i came in with the bet the best in- understanding of step one that i could at that time the concept of god was just really a simple um you know that aa maybe had something for me it was a step of hope in the sense that my life was somehow restored to sanity when i talked to my sponsor she just had a way to just kind of simplify things and and redirect it to some kind of principle in the steps and in the group and in aa and my life would be restored to sanity after a simple conversation with her and and so i could see step 2 kind of moving in that way my relationship with god would develop more as time went on but at that initial beginning that's all I started with. Step three was really broken down. To me, it's just often more clear what's not God's will for me than what is God's will for me. I think I've discovered more clearly what God's will is for me by just canceling out things that are obviously not. And that's that's just been my path. But she did, my, my first sponsor did give me some extra tips. She said, well, you obviously made it to AA. By the time I was like, by the time I was like, 
um, a couple months sober, I'd gotten a car. And this time my parents, my parents would not let me touch a single car of theirs. So they made me work for my own car and buy my own car this time. But I finally got a car back and I, I was somehow able to keep my license. And, uh, and so she said, well, you, you obviously have a car. So God must have need you to do service in Alcoholics Anonymous with your car. So you need to pick people up for meetings every meeting. And so she just sent me around picking people up and I it was great. She said, well, you, your home group meets three times a week. It's obviously God's will that you be at this group every, every time it met. And, uh, and so she just really gave me some very clear instructions on the third step. And I, but I was so willing. I conformed right away. And, um, and I had a neat experience, too, with the third step where I didn't quite... I was kind of on the fence still coming back in, and I remember those early days of, of being sober were very challenging for me. I would wake up and be, I, the, the fear would hit me, the panic of how to face the day ahead and the things that normal, the things that normal people do, I just didn't know how to do those things, and they generated a lot of anxiety in me and, and, so, and dread and, and negative thinking. And so I remember just being overwhelmed with that one morning waking up, and I just remember you know, it tearfully hitting my knees in my bedroom and just begging God that if, if God would just find, help me find another way to live, that I'd give him every experience, that he could, God could use every experience I'd ever been through in life. If it could serve anyone, just help me find a way to do this thing called life. And that to me was like where the third step really happened in my heart. And, and I, I've, I've held good to that. That's why I share openly about things that have happened to me because I can't tell you how many people have come up afterwards because of something that I've shared. They've said I have experience with that. And so I, um, that was the third step. I formally took it with the sponsor. I was babysat through the fourth step. I finally did a fourth step. My fourth step was much longer than I, most people's. I think Amy's going to have me beat. Um, but um, but um, I, um, I finally did my fourth step. I had the effect on people that I could scare people. Like in um, if I ever, the times that I had ever sought help at school, like with a guidance counselor, or if I had ever sought help in a church, the, the things, if I would ever share openly with people about the things that I was really doing and going through, it would scare those people. And so, um, and, and I would see that they judged me. I could see it. It was obvious. And, um, and so I thought I was afraid that my sponsor would have that same reaction. And so I had a tester before doing a fifth step. We went out to dinner one night before the meeting. I just dropped her something big, like in between bites, just to see her reaction. And like she was just unfazed. This is Sandy, who you all know very well, or many of you know very well. And, and she was just unfazed. She worked at like Nash Correctional at that time, you know, like, what did I expect? But she handled it flawlessly, and, um, and so she was worthy of hearing, and none, the women didn't start talking about me later or treating me different, so, um, so she was worthy to hear my fifth step, so I did my fifth step, I did the best that I could, I told everything that I could think, I've read my fourth step, and then if I thought of anything, little things that just didn't quite fit in a fourth step, I just threw them in, and, um, and I felt, I felt a weight lift after that, um, and, uh, but I, I entered into an, a neat growing stage next, um, of six and seven. And, um, and I, um, I had entered into sobriety, like I had had a colorful background and I had an, in, you know, I had gotten, I told you I was hundred percent committed to that lifestyle I found in my drinking. And so I came into AA and I didn't quite let go of all those tools that I had had to live in the streets and to survive there. I didn't let go of all those coming into AA, but a lot of those kind of things came up for, for question. Um, and then it also, the, the, the path began to narrow, and I began to realize that I couldn't have a clean conscience doing the things that I was doing, that it was harming other people that I was, and ultimately the guilt began to grow, and it, ultimately the obsession to drink came back because I was living um, very unspiritually in some ways. And um, so all that kind of came up for question in the steps six and seven, and I was just as, I was very reluctant to let that stuff go. And the, the, the example, the analogy that they give and how it works about the jumping off point, you know, that was what it was for me, what it was for me to let go of these, these six and seven step things that I had was that I didn't trust that I'd be okay letting them go. And so I just truly had to jump and trust and let go and believe God had me. And so it was very hard to do that. I, um, I, I, 
I had to lean on members of Alcoholics Anonymous to do that. I told you that the obsession of drink came back. It was on me just as strong as I had been in just like the first month or so of sobriety. It came right back. I wanted to drink. I couldn't stop thinking about it. I couldn't walk in grocery stores without. I couldn't walk through an alcohol aisle. I couldn't see a billboard. I mean, just all brought it back. And um, But I, I, I walked through that experience. I, I, I plugged into step six and seven. I began to practice the opposites. I began. I stopped taking actions that, that I shouldn't be taking and just leaned on members of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and I was able to make it through that with a deeper understanding of six and seven. I was completely committed from that point on to Alcoholics Anonymous and to being in this thing 100%, to, to living exactly, um, to, to live in a glass house. And, um, and and another thing, too, is that step one moved at a different level that time because in, in that return of the obsession drink, I fought it on my own in secret initially. But it got so great, the harder I fought to resist, try not to drink, to go back to drinking, the more it grew. And I reached a place where, I mean, I had been through return to drinking before. I knew what it looked like, and I was, I was, I was going to do it. And I realized that, and I never did, but I reached that point where I realized that I didn't have power within myself to even stop to, to, to stop the obsessions to drink. And and I have never questioned step one since then. And I had doubts about it before because I could un understand the unmanageability of step one, but I couldn't understand the powerlessness. And after that experience around six and seven, I came out with that with a different understanding of step one. So I, I worked through eight um, with the guidance of Steve uh, Mitchell, that, that I was a member of that group at that time, to work with family first. Um, I did some, some, some step work with my family. Um, I was guided on how to do amends um, and, um, and to follow it through with what can I do to make this right and make a living amends and things like that. And, and a, neat, a lot of neat stuff happened. Um, I made amends in the community to an old oral surgeon. You know, I was a kid that had a lot of potential, and so I looked good until you got, but until the alcohol tore things apart, and so I had a lot of good starts, but poor finishes, and so I had an internship with an oral surgeon in high school, and I was fired because I was an embarrassment at his practice. He told me that, and um, because of how publicly I lived my alcoholism, and, um, and, and so I went to make an amend for him, someone I still resented, and I was freed from the resentment after having made the, the amend, so I don't believe that I have to forgive everyone for me to go and make amends, um, so I had a neat experience with that. I, I believe that I've kind of always done step 10. I knew intuitively this time getting sober that I had to empty my head on a regular basis in order to be able to stay sober. I knew it. And so I would just kind of like empty every night. I'd just say everything that I thought that I had in, in there that was going to, that I could feel it. I just knew when I'd emptied. I emptied every night. And then when I was good, we would hang up. And I did that as long as I needed to. My sponsor, my friend Sandy, had patience of a saint. For five years, I called her every day. Um, but eventually I got to the point where I didn't need that as much. But um, I, I was doing the 10 step, just review, look for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. Sometimes I've gone through times where I've formally written it. I still try to focus on those things. And to this day, I do it working with a sponsor. They say in there like a solitary self-appraisal is insufficient. That means another person has to be involved. So I still talk to my sponsor regularly. He's put us on schedules um, right now, mine. Um, and uh, a lot of you guys know him. He's a good guy. And uh, so, but I just, I get organized before I call. And, I, and he always says, we can call them more if we need to, but but I um, I get organized before I call, and I just get down to business, and then I always remember to ask, is there anything you'd like to say? You know, because sometimes I don't give them time for that, you know, and uh, and then um, and I sit and listen, and um, and then um, the eleven step has just changed. Eleven step initially in sobriety relieved me of my panic attacks. It calmed those down. I think my meditation and prayer was best when I had an empty life. And then as college came in one day and as parenthood came in one day, all that came up for um, you know under attack. And um, and I eventually um, you know my meditation has changed and and looks different. It doesn't look the same as it used to, but I still get it in anywhere and everywhere I can um, because I'm a better person and member of Alcoholics Anonymous and mother and spouse when when I'm right. Um, I should probably mention um, I started working with people in, a, in, in the 12th step from that first year when I finished my steps. They put me right in. My first sponsor, I was only 19 and um, I, I didn't know who to sponsor. So um, 
And my, my first sponsor told me I dressed like a hooch. She likes me for, for me to say that. She dressed, told me I dressed like a hooch and that no one was going to ask me to be their sponsor if I didn't change the way I dressed. And, um, and so I had to start changing the way I dressed and carrying myself differently. But, you know, that's what AA does is that it brings us back. It socializes us back into the world. And that's what she was doing. And I couldn't find anybody to sponsor for a long time except for just the real crazy cases. I got all those. I, I tend to think I tracked them because I... I'm one of them too. And, uh, but I, I really got connected with um, writing inmates. That was the first thing that I did was corresponded through the mail um, and worked steps and was an AA contact for ladies inside the prison that um, you know, couldn't get out. And then, um, and then eventually when I was able, I started going in. And uh, that was, has been my service to this day. We're planning on going tomorrow as long as they'll let us in. And where we live, they're, they're canceling everything. Like our jail just gave us notice today. We can't go in for 30 days, so nobody will bring the coronavirus in. So... Um, but we're going to be there tomorrow. If they'll let us in, we'll be there tomorrow. And um, we, um, so we um, just, uh, I, I've, I've tried to really sincerely practice these principles in all my affairs. I did find out in my first year sober that I didn't have HIV. I don't know how or why. It just happened to not turn out for me. And I know that other people live with it. And it's not the destinance that it used to be when I, you know, back those 20 years ago. But um, yeah. The insanity was I thought I could go back and do it like I was ready for another round. And that's the insanity of my, my head. I didn't act on that, but that's the way my, that's where my head goes. So I came back. I, I really have, have had a great journey here. I've grown up in Alcoholics Anonymous. I've been able to, to gain a profession through a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Wallace told me that clock's five minutes fast. So he told me I had five more minutes. So, um, but I, so uh, I, um, I ended up um, getting a profession here in Alcoholics Anonymous only because a member gave me a job, and and I ended up it it turned out to be what I ended up doing only because like somebody at that job sent off for an admissions packet in the mail to come to my house. I didn't even ask for it, and it was for dental hygiene. I became a dental hygienist. I've been a dental hygienist for a long time. I had to go up against the board to get a license because of my colorful past, but I'd already been a member of Alcoholics Anonymous for a, a, quite a while prior to that, and they could see that the members on that, that board, I think are affiliated with this community. And, um, and they could see that, and so I um, ended up uh, getting a dental hygiene license. I graduated from dental hygiene school next door to the psych ward that I graduated from, just so I think God could remind me where I came from. And uh, I was able to go to, on to UNC and get a four-year degree. Uh, after that, I did two more years of college to learn how to speak Spanish. I speak Spanish now, um, and I'm able to be a member of Spanish Alcoholics Anonymous, and I've traveled the world. It's exciting. I've been able to have a family, and I've been at the same office for 16 years, which is unbelievable. Like, just to be able, the longevity of being able to maintain something. And I actually, my boss actually appreciates things that I share. That, like, she had me stay late one day this week just to get my insight and get help with some scenarios at the office. And, like, that's just an honor and a privilege to be looked at like that from someone that's known me that I've had a relationship with for that long. And, um, and so, anyway, um, I, uh, I've been able to really have a life beyond my wildest dreams. One of the ladies we go to the jail with says, that she's had the opportunity to live two lives in one. And that, I, that has been my experience. I have lived two lives that are so polar opposite. One person should not have that. I was completely committed to both. I mean, I lived each of them to the fullest, but I've been able to have both of those lives. And it's unbelievable to have been able to do that. And it's all because of Alcoholics Anonymous. So anyway, there you go. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you're not too